another season. First draft is underway. Jalen Carter, too quick, too powerful. Tends to hit the touchdown. That is a bad man. Oh, no, 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 no. Maybe the best player in the sport. Watch out for Mr. Robinson. Fifth touchdown pass for C.J. Stroud. Jackson Smith and Jigbo, arguably the top receiver in the country. If you didn't know the name Will Levis before tonight, you know it now. Richardson, lead throws a defender out of bounds. He is a highlight reel waiting to happen every time he touches the football. First draft is back. We are now just eight days away from the 2023 NFL Draft. We cannot wait for it all to get started in Kansas City. And because we are just eight days away, means this is the busy time of the pre-draft process. I'm Field Yates, as always, joined by the two men that you're really here for. That, of course, being Todd McShay on the right and Mel Kuyper Jr. on the left. And something special happened this week. Mel and Todd often are going back and forth at each other. But instead, Todd, you had the honor of working together on a three-round mock draft. Just pretend Mel can't hear you right now. What was it like being his teammate? Well, he was selfish. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> Mel. He was absolutely <laughs> selfish. He had all the odd picks, so he got to put Bryce Young in there and then laugh at me trying to figure out Houston at two. And then he, at five, he passes on his guy, Will Levis, with Seattle. Passes on him at seven because he has the odd picks again with the – with the Raiders, and then says he got a steal of the draft. How could he ever fall here? Will Levis at number 11 for Tennessee. We'll get to all that, but my point is I, I kind of got what I expected coming in. And, Mel, your thoughts? Yeah, I don't get the selfish stuff. I mean, he had the first pick last year. It's a revolving thing. It's a rotating thing. It's not being selfish. It's just, hey, you, you can't steal the show every year, Todd. You had the first pick last year. And as far as the picks go, Seattle has Geno Smith. Uh, Jalen Carter was you know, was gone, if I uh, remember correctly. I took him, so I have him on the board. So I take Jalen Carter over the quarterback because I got Geno coming off a career year. Then with the Raiders, I got the corner sitting there. I got Jimmy G. I, I'm, I got to think like the Raiders do. So that allowed, because you weren't taking him, with any of your picks, and we couldn't have a trade up because of your rules. We can't have a trade. He ends up being there at Tennessee at 11. I right. had to take him. So at the end of the day, you think he's dropping anyway. So what's the big problem here? All right. Well, just for those that may have missed it, it is available now on ESPN.com in full. And here's how the exercise actually broke down. I probably should have mentioned this at the outset, but it's a three-round mock draft. And Mel and Todd, as you already gathered, went back and forth on picks. Mel had the first overall pick. and He did all the odd number of picks. Todd got all the evens. And one very important note, this mock draft was not how they think the draft is going to play out, but rather what they would do if they were the GMs for the 32 NFL teams. Rather than going through every single pick or rehashing the top five like we've done so often in our mock draft breakdowns, we decided to do it a little bit differently. What we're going to do is look at about eight or so teams and take a look at their three or four or even five player hauls through these first three rounds. And we're going to begin at the very top of the board as the Panthers do have that number one pick. They ended up with Bryce Young from Alabama, and then moving down to 39, Jalen Hyatt, wide receiver from Tennessee, and then finally at pick number 93, Andre Carter II out of Army, who had just a remarkable season back in 2021, a little bit less production in 2022. Mel, because you had all of these picks at your disposal, you get the first sort of chance, your crack, at how you think the Carolina Panthers made out. Yeah, with Jalen Hyatt coming in with all that speed, obviously, he needs to fill that frame out a little bit, get a little stronger. And obviously, had some free run. Obviously, had offense, quarterback friendly. Obviously, offensive friendly with Josh Heupel. But I thought he had a spectacular year. He takes the top off of defense. And he can scare the heck out of a secondary and open up opportunities underneath as well for the other receiving options in the back out of the backfield, the tight end. So, I think Jalen Hyatt would make sense at that point. And then you think about Andre Carter the second coming into this year. I don't know where Todd had him in his way too early mock first round back in <laughs> May of last year, but Andre Carter II was coming off a phenomenal season. This year, obviously, at Army, you think, okay, we know we got to isolate and we got to factor in everything we do is on stopping and controlling and neutralizing Andre Carter II. Then you think about testing. Well, he's at Army. He's not 
thinking football 24 hours a day. He's an Army, right? He's at West Point. So he's got more important things to worry about, right? Bottom line is you're talking about a guy, once he gets into the NFL, and he learns here, I thought it was good, Todd, and feel from Brian Burns mm. at Carolina. You got a chance with those physical and athletic skills that he brings to the table. You got a chance to develop. We never talk about developing a pass rusher, developing this kid physically. I think they can do that at Carolina if they get him in round three. Todd, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, obviously, Bryce Young is a no-brainer. You get, you get the magician at the number one overall pick and a guy that you now can build your organization around. Carolina gave up a lot. First-round picks, second-round picks, wide receiver DJ Moore to go up and get the guy, and the guy is Bryce Young. So that was a no-brainer there. I like Jalen Hyatt. You know, I don't like him quite as much as some other people think. I think there's going to be an adjustment coming from that Tennessee scheme. And I also think that, you know, it was just one year of production, and he, he really took a while to kind of grasp everything. But when he did, my goodness, that Alabama tape, if you're going to study one tape of one player, pop in Jalen Hyatt against Alabama, and you'll, you'll see all you need to know in terms of his speed, his explosiveness, both as a vertical route runner and after the catch, as you see here, catching a quick slip screen and then going for, for a score. This guy has speed for days. He plays fast, and it's easy speed. So to, to pair that up with a young quarterback makes a lot of sense. And then after that, I, I, you know, I, I thought Andre Carter, listen, he did not have the season. Mel explained why that you expected from him. But to get Hyatt where you did the production he had this last year and then Andre Carter is a developmental edge, I thought it, it worked out well for Carolina. Yeah, and, and Todd, I'm not trying to nitpick over a guy that still ran extremely fast. But I think there were some that were wondering, could Jalen Hyatt run like a 4-2-8? Could he be like the Tyquan Thornton of this right. year's combine? He only – and only is the sort of interesting choice of word there, ran a 4-3-6-40. We have temporarily lost Mel Kuyper. Hopefully we can get him back here in just a second. But that means it's a good time to move on to the Philadelphia Eagles, Todd, because you had, I believe, all, if not most, of their picks in this exercise. Of course, Philly has an extra first-round pick, so I'll rip through their four selections. Mm -hmm. First up, Bijan Robinson, number 10 overall. Number 30 overall, that is their own pick. Miles Murphy from Clemson. And then the third round, Zach Pickens, excuse me, back into the second round, defensive tackle from South Carolina, a handful of South Carolina defenders on the draft radar this year. And then their final pick, number 94, at least of this exercise, Blake Freeland, offensive tackle from BYU. We saw him up close and personal at the Senior Bowl, Todd. So dive deeper into this haul for the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, we're going to start a GoFundMe for Kuiper and get some new technology <laughs> down there in Baltimore. But while, while you've got me here, I will we'll go through these Eagles picks. Now listen, I, I, to me, I know Eagles fans. You, you don't think that Howie Roseman is going to take a running back. I, I played Howie Roseman for a day. I would just love to see a backfield with Jalen Hurts and B. John Robinson. B. John Robinson has a lot of what Saquon Barkley has and a little bit of what Christian McCaffrey has, has in terms of being able to play out in the slot running down the field routes, not just screens and outlet passes, but actually running down the field. He had 91 force missed tackles this past year. The next highest was Frank Gore Jr. with 77. He's a difference maker. He can do it with his stiff arm, with the power, also with the, the unbelievable body control and ability to, to work laterally and, and slalom downhill like a Olympic gold medal super G dude. So like he, he's got all the, the things that you look for. I just think the number two player on my board going number 10, even though it's not what's, what Howie Roseman would do, I think there's something there. So, And I've heard even Atlanta, maybe a possibility at number eight. So we'll, we'll watch out for Bijan. But after that, Miles Murphy, he's a player who, you know, everyone talked about Brian Brzee coming into Clemson. He was a five-star. He was a higher recruit. Miles Murphy was the more consistent player at defensive end. He's a really physical player who is going to be strong versus the run. But I like his flexibility. He's got some bend to him. And you know what I've noticed over watching tape after tape after tape? Miles Murphy gets a lot of production from his great motor. And that's with a lot of the top pass rushers in the league. Yeah, you have to have traits. You have to have length. You got to have bend and closing burst. And he has a lot of those things. But what he does best is just get after you. He's going to hunt quarterbacks down, hunt ball carriers down from, the, from behind. I really like that. And then defensive tackle. After you get Miles Murphy for the Eagles, and I know they want to load up, even though they've got a bunch of dudes on the defensive front, they can't have enough. It's kind of like Howie Roseman says a quarterback, he wants to have a factory. He wants to have a factory of defensive linemen. And they've got some guys who are aging now, one-year contracts. So I went with Zach Pickens from South Carolina, who, listen, early in the process, we talked about him as a second-rounder. 
Then there were some concerns with him. Maybe he wasn't going to be the player that everyone expected. Now you're hearing more, more people talk about second round. This guy is loved by Shane Beamer and his coaching staff. The effort is there. The relentlessness is there. Just showing up every day with a workmanlike attitude. And he's got traits. I don't think he always played to his, his potential. And I think he's going to get better as he continues to play in the league. But that's a guy you come in 15, 20 snaps as a rookie who could wind up being your full-time starter a year or two down the road and give them a lot of depth to keep guys fresh. And then finally after that, with Zach Pickens and Miles Murphy along the defensive front, you know Howie Roseman, the GM, once again, is going to stick to the trenches. And I think of a player that he could be a steal in this draft is Blake Freeland, as you mentioned, from BYU. He was a four-year starter, and he got better each year. And his traits are really off the charts as an offensive line. You look at six, seven, and seven, eight inches. I'm talking about almost six, eight. 302 pounds. Ran a four, nine, eight. I think he was the second fastest of all the offensive linemen. And I hear it all the time. Who cares about a 40 for offensive linemen? Well, if you look at if you look at the history of it, there is a correlation between guys that run sub five second forties and success in the league. Freeland on tape, I thought maybe kind of like a fourth rounder, but then you look at the measurables and the traits that are so important to tackle. This guy has a lot of what you're looking for in a developmental project. I think in a year or two from now, we could be talking about Freeland as, as a starting tackle, whether it's at left or right, and he has experience on both sides. So the combine test really turned heads. His workout and performance at the Senior Bowl really helped his value. And I think, again, his tape was solid, but it wasn't exceptional. But a lot of times at this tackle position, you've got to draft guys that you can develop and have those traits. And Blake Freeland is, Blake Freeland, sorry, is loaded with the traits you look for. And, Todd, right now there is no better place for an offensive lineman that needs to develop to go than Philadelphia with Jeff Stoutland, who is right now the best yes. offensive line coach in the NFL. No question. All right, Todd, this might be a dream or a nightmare scenario. You can decide which, but we're going to have you play Mel for a few more minutes here as we continue to work through some technical issues with All his right. live shot. And we're going to go to the Kansas City Chiefs, who have a pretty cookie-cutter set of picks, their own, in each of the first three rounds. And, of course, at 31, as the defending champs, they're at the back end of each of the three rounds. I'll read the three picks, and there's some big names here. Will McDonald the fourth from Iowa State, of course, a favorite of Mel Kuyper who's been all over the first round for Mel, as high as eight and as low as 31. Then Marvin Mims Jr. out of Oklahoma. That dude had absurd production for the Sooners. He can fly, too. And then finally, Tyler Steen, Alabama offensive tackle, who go, goes from Vanderbilt, finishes up his career at Alabama. High IQ kid, versatility as well. And the Chiefs, as we all know, have had some moving parts on the offensive line this offseason. They did lose Orlando Brown mm -hmm. Jr., but that wasn't until after they signed Jawan Taylor, but they lost right tackle Andrew Wiley. So what do you make of this haul here for the Chiefs? Yeah, I'll say it because Mel's not here. Mel did a great job with the Chiefs picks. <laughs> I, listen, I, I think Will McDonald, we, we, we've joked around a lot about Will, Will McDonald because Mel's had him as far as the second round up to number eight overall and then 24th and third, 30th. But I think this is the sweet spot. Late in the first round for Will McDonald, He's undersized, 6'3 and a half, 239 pounds. But you watch him. He's got the explosiveness off the snap. He's got the bend that you look for. He is so flexible as an athlete. You see, like, he's going to fight through blocks. He's going to be get back on his feet. He, he led the Big 12 and tied for first nationally in total sacks last year with 10 and a half. And, and then uh, Big 12 sack leader in, uh, the year ago uh, with 11 and a half. So a year before that. So this guy has been productive. He's done it for a few years. In the last two years especially, I like this. is bringing in another edge rusher for the Chiefs. They can't have enough guys up front that can get to the quarterback. And Will McDonald would make a lot of sense there. Then you go to Marvin Mims, who, who you just mentioned. Mims, to me, is one of the most athletically gifted wide receivers in this class and I sometimes after watching the tape and put going through my report I wonder like, why isn't he ranked a little bit higher I talk yep. to people in the league they're like yes yeah, he's just another one of these guys that is a little bit undersized and it doesn't fit the prototype of the big receivers we're looking for but man he just kept making plays and he was so productive his athletic numbers were off the charts he's five yeah he's 511 great 183 pounds but he ran a 438 in his 40 yard dash he blew up the combine with all of his shuttles and everything that he did. And then you talked about the production. He had a career-high 1,083 receiving yards this past year. 
and he had over a thousand yards receiving each of the past three seasons. So, and he averaged 19.5 yards per catch, sir. 20 touchdowns. Like this guy is a playmaker, and I think we're where uh, the Chiefs are getting him. I think in the it's 63 late in the second round is right around where he's going to go. And then finally, Tyler Steen. He he's just a really good football player. He's consistent. The coaching staff, I've talked to Nick Saban about him. Just love his toughness. He also, I, I was at that pro day, and Steve, they were going through all the, the flexibility drills and stretching and all that. For his size, for you know, for a bigger offensive tackle who I think is going to fit best at guard probably when it's all said and done, he was really flexible and, and moves pretty well. So I think Steen, who started out, as you see here, Vanderbilt early in his career, came to Alabama, had a really good season. I think he's going to wind up in that third round range where Kuiper had him going late in the third round. Worst case, he goes early fourth. But let's face it, we got to protect Patrick Mahomes and bringing in Steen, who, you know, 50, uh, what, what was it? Um, he had, I forget, 40 plus starts at the college level. This guy's NFL ready. And, and yes, he was playing at Vanderbilt in the SEC, but doing it at Alabama at a high level, you know, gives me more, more assurance, if you will, that he's ready to step in and, and take a starting role, whether it's year one or year two. Todd Kuiper, well done right there. Let's move forward from the Chiefs to the Thank Cowboys, you. which – were actually your picks, Todd. And let's run through them. One, two, three. Again, their own picks. Quinton Johnston, wide receiver from TCU, 26th overall. Sam Laporta from Iowa. We all love him. Tight end. He goes 58th overall. And then Kendra Miller. So you double dip with TCU offensive players. Number 90. He had an awesome mm -hmm. year running back for TCU. So dive deep. This is three offensive players for the Cowboys in their first three picks. Yeah, I mean, they had a top 10 defense a year ago, right? So we, we got to get some more weapons on the offensive side. Now, that was really my objective. I'll, I'll be honest. I think Dallas should, and I've heard the rumors that they could move up from 26 to go get B. John Robinson, the Texas running back. I would love that fit. Mike McCarthy is looking for that big back to complement Tony Pollard, and, and the versatility that B. John would bring would be outstanding. But if they can't get that done and they're stuck back here and the tight ends are off the board – then I just had to go with the best pass catcher available, and that was Quentin Johnson. I even said during our mock draft, maybe a little bit high. He could be early second, but he's somewhere in that range. Quentin Johnson, I called him the pterodactyl. I stopped calling him that because Mel yelled at me, and now Mel's calling him the pterodactyl every time I turn on Sports Center or NFL Live. So Quentin Johnson, he does have that great length, and I'll agree with Mel on one thing. I'd like to see him go up and high point the ball more to utilize that length. He's a 6'3 receiver, over 200 pounds. And he, the jump balls, he wins a lot of them just because he's so big, but he can win even more by going up and high pointing it. But what I love about Johnson's game, for a long levered receiver, he is really twitchy after the catch and creates yards after the catch. So Quentin Johnson for Dak Prescott would be another big outside weapon who could be a vertical receiver and also can create with the ball in his hands. And I'd like to see that. And I, I stuck with this team. You know, the Cowboys, we've got to get more playmakers. I don't think that they, you know, after Dalton Schultz leaves in, in free agency, they don't have a guy that is the security blanket or a difference maker in the passing game. That's why I went with Sam Laporta as their second pick in the second round, the Iowa tight end. And listen, this class is loaded with tight ends. We've talked a lot about Dalton Kincaid from, from Utah. We've talked a lot about Michael Mayer from Notre Dame, his first rounders. You know, Darnell Washington from Georgia, late first, early second. Luke Musgrave, Oregon State. But you can still get an impact player like Laporta in the mid to late second round. And what I like about Laporta, in, in addition to his ball skills, this guy's an underrated athlete. He can stretch the seam. He can make plays as kind of that flexed out tight end and, and that F tight end role. And he can create after the catch. It's so important for tight ends to be able to do that. And it's hard to find. And Laporta does that pretty well. You see, even getting involved in the screen game, he's got some juice after the catch, and I think he would be a great addition. You get a wide receiver, you get a tight end, whatever order that is with your first couple picks. And I think running back is going to be in the mix too. That's why with the, the third pick there, I went with, with Kendra Miller from TCU, who is coming off that injury that he had in the, the semifinal game against Michigan, right, in that big upset against the Wolverines. He played well in that game, and he played well all season long. I'm a big Kendra Miller fan. People say, well, I don't know about his speed. I don't know about his juice. All I see is a guy who's light on his feet. He's kind of a pick and slide runner, but when he finds his crease, he's going to go. He's got that acceleration. I don't think he has great top end speed, but I'm less worried about that and more worried about lateral agility and having the ability to just get downhill and get through the crease. And yes, he's not the, the biggest back, 
but he's still 5'11 and change at 215 pounds, and he runs with good contact balance. So I think the big thing for him is can he, how productive can he be in the passing game? And it's never been a big role that he's had. Uh, only 16 catches last season. But when you've got Tony Pollard and you're talking about a third round back, this would be a good compliment. If you're not going the home run route by moving up for B. John Robinson, let's wait till the third round where there's a lot of value in a deep running back class. And I think Kendra Miller would be a home run as a late third round pick for the Dallas Cowboys. Todd, indications are it's going to be you and I the rest of the way here by ourselves on first draft. So I'm going to yeah, I maybe as air much. things out a little bit. I'll maybe uh, give you a chance to catch your breath a little bit more. You have been on a marathon today as we actually taped a couple of shows that are going to be available on <laughs> ESPN Plus later on this week. There's great content coming your way. Let's move to the Buffalo Bills, and this was a Kuiper special here. He had all of the Bills picks, and he started off with Trenton Simpson, the linebacker out of Clemson, a phenomenal athlete, followed up by Josh Downs, wide receiver from North Carolina, who in some ways kind of reminds me of what you were saying to Marvin Mims, like why aren't we talking about him more? He had crazy production playing with both Sam Howell and also Drake May. And then Antonio Johnson in the third round, he's a safety from Texas A&M, Probably the second best safety in this year's class. But, Todd, as we know, not exactly an exemplary safety class this year. So what do you make of this haul from Kuiper for the Bills? Two out of three on defense and that linebacker spot particularly notable after losing Tremaine Edmonds to the Bears in free agency. Yeah, I think off the ball linebackers is an important position for the reason you just stated. Um, Trenton Simpson, I, I made the joke, it it's a, might have a nosebleed by getting drafted this high. I'm not trying to knock Trenton Simpson. I'm just trying, trying to t say where the value is in terms of this linebacker class. I think it's probably in the second round range. And I've actually heard because uh, Jack Campbell from Iowa is working out with Luke Keekley and Keekley's background of the Panthers with the organization, you know, some of the key people of the organization with the Bills, that could be a mix. But regardless, Trenton Simpson, He's 6'2 and a half, 235 pounds. He ran a 4'4'3. I mean, what, since when are these linebackers running in the 4'3s, 4'4s? It's, it's ridiculous. They're like wide receivers, but that's how the game is. Forget stack and shed, taking on blocks. Today's NFL guy has got to be able to play sideline to sideline. He's got to stay in on passing downs. He's got to be able to cover. And that's what Trenton Simpson does. And I'll say this about Trenton. His production was very good. His versatility is even more intriguing. That's why if he does go in the first or early in the second round, it's because he can play every down and he can play multiple positions. Then with this, the second pick, I, I like this pick, Josh Downs. And you're, you got to remember, we're picking late in the second round, so it's not like early mid when we talk about some of the other wide receivers. Josh Downs was so productive at UNC. And this past year, when you look at it, there was really nobody else for Drake May, the, the star quarterback who's probably going to be a top five pick a year from now to go. And so Downs had to get open. And at just five, eight and a half, 171 pounds, that's tough to do, to rely on that kind of receiver to consistently get open. But Downs did. That's what he did over and over again. You know, he, he led the ACC in receptions each of the past two years and set a program record with 101 catches back in 2001. I mean, over and over again, all he did was produce He's going to be a slot receiver in the league. I think he could step in right now and could add some depth to that receiver group for, for Josh Allen, as a, again, as a slot who's never going to be an elite playmaker for you, but I think he would be a 40, 50, 60 catch a year type of receiver, and he's used to being the guy. So I really like that pick as well. And then finally, Antonio Johnson, safety from Texas A&M. He is a thumper, and what I love about him is I call him cheat code. Because he, he like knows the play before it comes. And I love that about players. He's not going to run the best 40. He's not going to be a single high safety. But he plays near the line of scrimmage in kind of that star role for Texas A&M. And that's how I envision him at the next level. He's going to be an in-the-box safety who's going to be great versus the run. He, highly productive tackler. Very good in, in open space. But he's always reading screens and getting them early. He's always seen a pulling guard coming his way. And it's like he knows the play before it happens. And that's why he overcomes some of his lack of elite traits. He has good traits, but not elite traits. And was so productive uh, the last couple of years for Texas A&M. He was dinged up a little bit this past year, but came back. I, I just like his play temperament. I like his toughness, his tackling skills, and most importantly, his instincts near the line of scrimmage. And for the Bills, although they do have Jordan Poyer back in the fold, 
uh, both mm -hmm. he and Micah Hyde uh, in their 30s now. And it was great to see that DeMar Hamlin right. is going to be able to return to the NFL as yes. he begins his comeback. But obviously when he got hurt, uh, excuse me, when he, when he suffered a traumatic incident on the field, the Bills uh, were tested for depth at that safety spot. Hopefully Hamlin is back and better than mm -hmm. ever this year on the field. Let's go from the Buffalo Bills to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And an editor's note here. This mock draft was submitted and posted before the trade for Allen Robinson, which I'm not sure it really changes that much for the Steelers' future, as Robinson obviously no longer a dominant player. But let's run through the picks. Again, these were actually a Kuiper McShay split. First pick, Zay Flowers out of Boston College. That's number 17 overall. Number 32 overall, top of the second round. Brian Branch, the defensive back from Alabama. Anton Harrison from Oklahoma. I think he's underrated as well at 54. Maybe I just love those Oklahoma guys. And then Dayan Henley, inside linebacker from Washington State, number 87 overall, began his college career at Nevada. Super versatile player, Todd. And the Steelers add on both offense and defense in this most recent mock draft. Yeah, I, I, I really like what, what has happened here with the Steelers. You look at what their picks are. And I think Zay Flowers, Mel and I joke around about it. It's my guy. No, it's my guy. It doesn't matter. No. Zay Flowers is a great football player. He's your guy. And, and Jackson Smith and Jigba, Ohio State, is, is going to be the first receiver off the board. I'll be shocked if Zay Flowers is not the second receiver off the board. And, and could Pittsburgh go offensive tackle here? Absolutely, especially after, after the trade. But let's just talk Zay Flowers for a second, what he provides. Undersized guy who bulked up into the 190 during the pre-draft process. I met with Jeff Halfley in the, in the preseason. I went to one of their practices. He just raves about this guy. Energizer Bunny is what he calls him. He brings energy to the field, to the practice field, to the film room, in the building. And you see it in his play. He doesn't care that he's not a 6'3 wide receiver. He's going to go up and get the football. And he did that consistently. You look at his career, over 3,000 yards. Who played quarterback for them? Where was the blocking up front? Who were the other receivers to take pressure off him? He was a one-man show in the Heights for Boston College. And it was fun to watch, even against teams like Clemson, the production that he had. I think Zay Flowers is going to be a stud, whether it's in Pittsburgh or another team drafting in that 20 to 31 range. Then you talk about after that, Brian Branch. I love that pick because you get versatility, I should say, as a safety who can play nickel, can play outside corner at times. And the thing with Brian Branch is he didn't run well. Great, but he plays faster than anyone in that secondary, including two other guys that are getting drafted at the safety position. And so to me, Branch is a player who understands the game. He reads the quarterback's eyes. He's always getting early jumps. And yes, he ran a, a four, five, eight in his 40 yard dash. I don't care. I, I just, I trust the tape and I trust the football player. He's got ball skills. He's a reliable tackler. And he became the leader of that back seven this past year. It was fun to watch him play and really emerge into the star player that he was. And I think this would be a perfect fit for that. Mike Tomlin looking for defensive backs all the time in that secondary. Then Anton Harrison. You mentioned him. Anton Harrison, we've talked a lot about the top tackles. Peter Skaronsky from Northwestern. You've got, you go down to a Paris Johnson Jr. From, from Ohio State. You also got Broderick Jones from Georgia. We know all the names. I think the second tier, though, probably early in the second, late in the second, is going to be Anton Harrison starting that group out. And when you look at him physically, he's 6'4", 315 pounds. He's another one of just a small hand, hand few of guys, handful of guys, I should say. I'm running out of gas here, Field, who ran a sub five-second 40-yard dash. That tells a lot to me. I know you don't run 40-yard dashes as a, an offensive lineman very long, but there's a strong correlation between that athleticism and that speed and success in the NFL. You look at what he was able to do, started 23 games at left tackle, one game at right tackle the past two years. I think there's traits to develop here. I don't know that he's a complete player yet. He's got some nasty to him, though, and I think when it's all said and done, Harrison could wind up being a starter in the league. And then finally, Henley, the inside linebacker from Washington, I love this guy's coverability. At the Senior Bowl, he was the guy that every running back was kind of, uh, not, you go next. I don't want to match up against him. No one wanted to go one-on-one -on -one against him in coverage because he stoned every single running back. And for those of you who don't know, it, this is stacked heavily in the favor of running backs. That's how good he was at the linebacker position. I don't know in all my years, 20 years going to Senior Bowl, that I've seen a linebacker hold up so well. So Henley, yes, he's not a stack and shed guy. He's not physical versus the run. He's kind of got a lean frame. 
but he is athletic. He is ferocious. He plays like every single play is the last down of his football career. And I think he's going to bring a lot, not only in coverage right away, but also on special teams. And you get down in that third round range, pick number uh, 87 overall. That's why I took him. I think he can contribute right away cover in coverage and sub packages, contribute on special teams, and eventually develop into an every down starter if it's for the Pittsburgh Steelers in this scenario. Yeah, Todd, I'm not necessarily the biggest uh, player comparison fan, but like worst case scenarios, he could have a career that's kind of like what Tanner Muse has become, who similarly athletic linebacker out of Clemson yes. a few years ago, safety slash linebacker, and he's become a really good special teamer now for the Pittsburgh Steelers after a run uh, with the Seattle yep. Seahawks and the Raiders as well. Never quite panned out defensively, but if the floor is a good special teamer, there's some value in that somewhere in the middle round of yeah, the draft. Is. All right, so let's move to the Jets, and I'm going to take my time here to let you catch your breath. This Jets draft conducted by you and Kuyper, this feels like it's out of the Joe Douglas lab. Yeah, cheers to that. Uh, first off, the Jets go Broderick Jones, left tackle from Georgia, 13th overall. A reminder, the Jets still own, oh, excuse me, 14. Uh, four, pick, oh, I, I take that back. Pick 13 is correct. And then 42 and 43, of course, uh, the Jets might eventually trade one of those picks for Aaron Rodgers. It's, let's not let's leave that one alone for right now because that trade has been hovering over the NFL for multiple years. But Broderick Jones first, and then 42nd overall, Joe Tipman, Wisconsin center. And how long has it been since we had a Wisconsin center get drafted and play really well? Not that long because Wisconsin churns out NFL-ready centers. Tipman, the next in a long line of quality Wisconsin big men. And then finally at number 43 in the second round, Aditamiwa Adabare, the defensive tackle from Northwestern, who, by the way, we'll be talking about his two younger brothers at some point on this show because they're star football players as well. Adabare was an awesome, awesome senior bowl standout, Todd, and a guy who, despite his smallish, smallish stature for a defensive tackle, ran a 4 4 9 40. Let's go through those three players. Let's actually start, though, again with Broderick Jones. Yeah, Joe Douglas got his skill guys last year, right? You got, you got the defensive rookie of the year in Sauce Gardner, offensive rookie of the year, Garrett Wilson. Could have been offensive rookie of the year in, in uh, Bryce, Bryce Hall. Uh, the running back coming Brees out of Hall, Iowa yeah. State and, and before his injury, Brees Hall, sorry. And this year it's about the trenches, especially if you've got Aaron Rodgers coming in. They've got to protect Aaron Rodgers and be, give him the time to get the ball to these weapons and the young weapons that they have and the new weapons that are coming in. Broderick Jones makes a lot of sense to me. You know, for the New York Jets sitting at 13, Jones, everyone talks about Peter Skaronsky, and yes, he's, he's probably going to be the first offensive lineman off the board, and he should be. Jones might have the most upside as a pure left tackle, though. 6'5", 311 pounds. He only started 16 games at Georgia. Started a little bit on the right, right side in 2021, then became a 15-game full-time starter on the left side this past year. And he ran the fastest 40. We mentioned a couple other guys, sub-five-second 40s. He ran the fastest 40-yard dash of all the offensive linemen with 4'9'7". What I love about him is he's got the long arms, almost 35 inches, and... This past year, just being a first-year starter, 445 pass pro snaps, snaps, zero sacks allowed, zero holding penalties. So could there be a little bit of a learning curve? Yes, but I like the fact that he's played left tackle and right tackle, and there's some moving parts with that offensive line for the Jets, so that versatility will help. Then you go to the center. Joe Tipman, in my opinion, is the best center in this class. We talk a lot about John Michael Schmitz from Minnesota, but Tipman is more athletic, and he's kind of – a little bit of a unicorn. Like, how many six foot six centers move like this? That was the biggest six. He was an underclassman, so I didn't get his tape done early. Popped it in around January before the before the Senior Bowl and Combine, and, and tried to get ready for that. And I, the first thing that jumped out was, my goodness, he's flexible. He's a knee bender. He moves really well laterally, and they use a lot of poles from their center and second level blocks from their center. And he's out leading in the charge in front of these running backs behind him. Plus the fact, great communicator. Two-year starter, but I think his football IQ is that of like a five-year starter coming in the league. I think for the Jets, if they get him in the second round, or if it's John Michael Schmitz, whoever it is, he could be an up, that could be an upgrade at the center position. And finally, you mentioned the Northwestern defensive lineman, Adabare. I love this guy. And I know that there are mixed opinions on him in the league. I've talked to some people who say, yeah, we've got you know early third. Some people say we've got him late first. He's a defensive end. That's how he's listed. But he's kind of a sawed-off defensive end at 280 pounds. And 
What I love about him is it's 6'1 and a half, 282 pounds. He ran a 4'49. Did you hear me there? Field 449. Like what is going on? 449. He had a great week at the at the senior bowl. And then I went back and watched more tape. I said, you know, maybe he's just a workout warrior. Maybe he's just like showed up in the pre-draft process. He owned the Ohio State offensive line. You know where he did most of his damage? As a three technique inside. I think you're gonna say at a at a bar eight, wind up moving inside a little bit more than even he played at college, which he played extensively and become a three technique there. <laughs> Get to like 290, 295 with that 449 speed. And now you've got a three technique that can penetrate, disrupt. He just, he, he penetrates, locates, and hunts. That's what he does. And he did it against Ohio State, was probably the best offensive line he faced. And he, he, he really threw a, a, a loop into what the, the Buckeyes were trying to do because he was constantly in the backfield. It's been a while since we had, I guess it was a while, prior to Rashawn Slater being taken in the first round, that we had had a first-round pick from Northwestern. I think the last one prior to Rashawn Slater was Luis Castillo back in, like, what was it, like 2004 yes. maybe? Uh, but we may yeah, well have right. two guys in the first round if Adabari finds a way to sneak in there. Again, this latest mock draft projects in 43 in the Mel and Todd special. All right, Todd, you get to catch your breath. That has been absolutely ridiculous marathon work right there from you. We're going <laughs> to come back in just a minute and wrap up the show with a couple of players as part of Todd's spotlight. But first, Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, Geico can help, like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And Geico is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com or contact your local agent today. And you may have heard, baseball is back. Get your ballpark on with tickets from Vivid Seats. Or enjoy hockey and basketball in all their glory with courtside seats. Whoever you're rooting for, there's nothing like the thrill of seeing your favorite team live. Vivid Seats, the official ticketing partner of ESPN, is offering you $10 off your first $100 ticket purchase with code DRAFT. That's code DRAFT, D-R-A-F-T. Download the app or visit vividseats.com today. Vivid Seats, life happens live. All right, so we're hoping... And Todd has adequately caught his breath and got enough stamina left in the tank to wrap things up with a couple of players that are part of your spotlight players. And Todd, we're always looking for guys who maybe will go higher than the public discourse would suggest. Who are a couple of names that come to mind for you? Yeah, these are a couple of guys that are just talking to teams in the league. And they're saying, you know, watch out for this guy. He could be early second. Your guys, you, everyone's projecting him late second, early third. Could be late first. I'm going to start with Tyreek Stevenson, the cornerback from Miami. He's getting a lot of love in league circles. The big question mark with him was his eye discipline. Is he consistent enough in that regard? He had a great week at the Senior Bowl. I think when you play him one-on-one, like man-to-man, he's, he's at his best, where he can just read the receiver's routes. He's got it. To me, solid traits all around. Just over six foot, 198 pounds. Ran a really solid 4.45 in the 40-yard dash. Longer arms, and I love his aggressive attacking play. You can see that he is strong. He is physical in coverage, and he does a very good job of aggressively supporting the run. So you're getting a player who, you know, to me, intercepted three passes, 14 pass breakups in the past two seasons. But the production wasn't great on the ball. It was good enough. But I love the fact that he's a complete football player. And I think with Stevenson is another guy, like I mentioned, talking to teams in the league, he's not going to go late first. But everyone was saying late second, maybe early third. I think he could go, good, could go in the top 10, 12 picks in the second round in a very deep cornerback class. Then it guards Steve Avila. This is a name that's hot right now. Mm. I feel like every time I pick up the phone, someone in the league is saying, uh, where's Avila going? They're asking. That's when they're nervous. Where's Avila going to go? Don't be surprised if Steve Avila from TCU winds up in the late first round. It's kind of that 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 pick that shocks everybody. Who's this guy, Steve Avila? Well, Avila was a multi-year starter. You go back to 2020, started all nine games that year. Six at center, two at right tackle, one at right guard. 2021 starts 12 games at center and led the team with 1,044 snaps played. Then this past year, starts all 15 games at left guard because they brought in a transfer uh, at the center position and was the team captain. So he's experienced. 
I love the versatility. He's strong. He's got mobility. We talked a lot about Osiris Torrance from Florida. And I think Osiris Torrance is going to be a really good player, but he's a 330 plus pound guard. Avila gives you a little bit more mobility, a little bit better in pass protection. And again, that position versatility is a guy who can play both guard spots, center, and maybe even in a pinch play right tackle if you need him. But I think he's going to be a really good starting guard, and he's a plug-and-play starter with all that experience he had at TCU. Yeah, Todd, it would be interesting if he winds up being the highest-drafted offensive player from TCU this year. I still think Quinton Johnson might have the slight know, edge there. right? Who would have guessed? Yeah, but it won't be the most totally shocking thing if Steve Avila ends up being the highest-drafted Horn Frog with plenty of others that will come off the board at some point later on. Todd, you have earned a break, my man. Go catch your breath. Go take a nap. Go get yourself some hydration because Appreciate it, that was about 40 straight minutes of Todd McShay talking, which made all of us smarter. Just warming up for certain... the draft, man. I know this is perfect practice for next week. We'll be back on Monday at uh, 3, 2 or 3 p.m. Eastern time. But check out First Draft, 3 p.m. Next uh, Monday, make that 2 p.m. I can't hear, apparently. 2 p.m. next Monday. Final first draft before the actual NFL draft. We think Mel will be back, but no promises as of right now. For Todd, I'm Field. We'll talk to you guys again next week.